I like doing voices. Oh, I think that's great. All right, we are kicking off. It is top of the hour. Uh, welcome everybody to Live with Search Engine Land. And uh, this week we're doing a special episode on all things commerce marketing and commerce marketing particularly during the time uh, that we are all finding us in these strange, strange times. So um, I just want to say, you know, we're going to be talking about how, I mean, every sector in this economy has been affected by this. And what I think has been really interesting and um, it, everyone's facing challenges where there's sort of this feast or famine uh, that is, you know, some businesses are just seeing unprecedented demand and other businesses are seeing unprecedented lack of demand, which both are facing unique challenges with, um, all these changes. And, um, and so we're going to have this discussion um, with our terrific panelists today. We're also streaming live on YouTube. So if you are watching with us, feel free to put questions in the chat and we will be monitoring that and, and taking your questions. So um, I'm going to introduce our team. We've got uh, uh, Caitlin McGrew, who's SEM strategist at uh, digital marketing agency at PMG. We've got Bryant Garvin. Actually, I'll go down the, I'll go on the grid. <laughs> We've got um, Tony Berry, VP of e-commerce at the Integer Group. And Bryant Garvin uh, in the quadrant below me is a CMO at Groove Life. So I'm going to have each of you just give a little bit about um, where you're located right now and uh, the kinds of things that you're focused on and then we'll we'll get going in. So Caitlin, why don't we start with you? Awesome, so I am located in Fort Worth, Texas and I focus on search. So Google, Bing, as well as Amazon search. Great, and Tony. Sorry about that. I'm unmuted now. Sorry. Uh, yes, Tony Berry, as you mentioned. And, and what I work on is a lot of D2C and Amazon, Walmart, and some of the other larger club and mass and uh, grocery retailers. Great. And Brian. Awesome. I'm the CMO at Groove Life, a bootstrap startup out of Tennessee, and basically overall growth, marketing, product development wholesale, customer service, and basically everything is customer facing. So, especially right now. A little bit crazy. Yes. Um, so everyone's working from home. We were talking earlier about how we're all um, in the same boat um, and trying to make our work environments quiet during this time with shoving people out of the uh, our respective spaces. So I just I'd love to just chat a little bit about um, work life and um, what it means in terms of how you're being finding yourself being most productive, how you're working with both your teams, your clients, your stakeholders, and um, and any kind of learnings or tips you have for, for folks that you've kind of taken from this experience so far? So that to, to anyone. Sure, I can kickstart that one. So I am used to going to the office every day. So this has been a big adjustment on my end um, working from home. Um, luckily at PMG, it's been very helpful. Um, they reach out to us every day, checking in um, just from a work perspective as well from a mental perspective and I think that that's been very helpful. They've been providing um, activities for us like coloring books to let your mind um, exercise in a different way and let out some of that stress that you might be holding and that you don't realize. Um, so I find that doing things like that that are a little bit more creative um, to let some of the I guess uh, tension of not going outside free. So I find that being helpful. Oh that's great. That's awesome. Uh, I'll, all right, <clears throat> I will. I'll jump in on that as well. Uh, so we've been using. Oh goodness, sorry, I smashed my desk. Uh, so with with in terms of our teams, I think we've done a really good job of trying to do biweekly check-ins. 
uh, so grabbing that whole team and then pulling them together just to address any issues for the week, uh, trying to stay at least visually. Uh, so we're not just doing emails all the time because um, that could start to seem like, oh, it's a ghost. Uh, these emails just show up from, from anywhere. Uh, with clients, it's been, it's been pretty good. Uh, I think we've focused on email quite a bit, uh, but we are trying to incorporate Zoom and WebEx and some of these other meetings just so that they know we're here, we're here, and we're, we're creating a different type of connection. Productivity has been interesting. Um, I find that, uh, so we've been doing this for about three to four weeks now. So I think we're on week four, uh, maybe even going into week five. Uh, so I found that the first couple of weeks, I was just, I couldn't even get out of this chair. I mean, honestly, it was the way the calendar started to fill up was kind of insane. It just, everything that we could have done in person now required 15, 30 minutes. So like you start looking at your calendar and it's just 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. with like maybe 15 minutes in between to do something like eat, maybe even go to the bathroom occasionally, mm -hmm. which would be great. Um, so, so I think now that we've, everyone's sort of readjusted uh, and starting to get a little bit more comfortable doing this and setting defined you know, rules for the house and space and everything else, uh, I've noticed that it's, it's really become a, a much easier, better workflow over the last week or two. So I think everyone's starting to hit their stride, get in the groove and, and move and do that stuff. So you know, overall, the experience hasn't been bad. Uh, I, I'm used to working remote. Um, so I've done it in the past and did it quite a lot when I was uh, running my own business. So like for me, it was, it took a, it took a minute to relearn like riding a bike, but now well, feeling good. I'm back in it. So my experience anyway. Yeah. Great. How about you, Brian? Um, for me, I feel like my days are all meetings these days. Honestly, um, especially with touching so many different departments in the company. Um, I feel like I everything is a meeting during the day now it's because again, every other week we got it out in the office in Nashville and able to like have somebody walk over and spend two minutes and be done with something or there's a lot of Slack conversations or even I'll get a Slack call in the middle of having another call and somebody will call me on my cell phone at the same time. So it's like a little bit of overload. I find myself actually getting all of the work I need to get done in the evenings, <laughs> like the stuff that nobody else can do. Um, so my days are a little bit longer, but I'm also really grateful that we can do it, right? Like this would have been so much harder even five years ago to have had this happen. Yeah. Um, Zoom didn't really exist five years ago. Like all of these message platforms really didn't exist five years ago at scale and with the ability to do this. So I'm just really grateful that we can do that and that I I'm working for a company where it's all e-commerce and everything's remote um, except for my fulfillment and production, which is all out there in Nashville, Tennessee. And we've got all of that there. So I'm feeling full chest and all that. But it's been a little crazy, but it's still awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in Salt Lake area. Yeah, I'm in the Salt Lake area now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful trees behind me. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's gorgeous. Sun's out right now. It snowed a little bit yesterday. The sun's out today. So we're good. I love it. Yes, I, um, I'm in Maine, we have no leaves, and uh, <laughs> it is so cold. Um, but I was saying, you know, so I've been working from home and working with uh, a remote native team here at Search Engine Land for many years, and before that was doing consulting remote. Um, so for me, it's sort of just second nature, and I forget, I mean, that's the bad thing, is that I forget that everyone else is readjusting. Um, so it, it has been really interesting and I um, kudos to all of you for making it work and making it work with teams. And I love that idea of the coloring books, but I bet if you said that you're, <laughs> if somebody said, would you love it if your company sent you coloring books like six weeks ago, you would have been like, that is, no thanks. Yeah, <laughs> now, <laughs> I, love, I, I, I love the concept behind it, letting your, um, your mind go to a different place. So that's great. Uh, so let's talk commerce and um, what you all are seeing in the market. And um, Brian, why don't we start with you being in-house? And um, so just to give a quick background on Groove Life, you make silicone rings and watch bands, 
you've got, I know this because I just talked to Bryant for um, a story I was doing a couple weeks ago and you've got manufacturing stateside, you are selling, your channels are direct, Amazon and retail. Yeah. Right. So we've, yes, we've got a lot of retail. A lot of our retail right now is the, the small mom and pop, what's called the gift sector. And most of those are not considered necessities, right? So like a lot of companies, if you're not in the necessity game right now, your retail channel, your wholesale channel, whatever you want to call it, is completely dried up or closed down and hardly anything's coming through. Um, we took a big hit with Amazon. About the same time, we took a big hit with e-commerce right around March 13th when people started doing the closing and kind of that forced stay-at-home stuff. And then we've just kind of gone all in on doing things differently, right? Like all the ads that were working previously, just all overnight quit working. We had to start shifting our strategies. Luckily, we're really video heavy. <clears throat> and so kind of like we were when I was at Purple, we're really video heavy. And so we we're able to shift a lot of our entertaining videos to the forefront now. And we've actually started to see a big uptick where those wouldn't necessarily work on Facebook previously. They're actually starting to work again now. A lot more on YouTube, things like that. We actually launched new products. Um, two weeks ago, we launched a medical ring. Like uh, we have a hero collection. So we launched some medical rings that are engraved and painted right there in Tennessee to support all of the frontline workers, donating 25% of the proceeds to like the first responders first. We just launched tiger rings today to capitalize on the Tiger King phenomenon. So like we're like, because we're all digitally natively vertically integrated right there, like, and we've got all like from design to prototyping to full production, I can do all of it within a couple of weeks right there in Tennessee. It's been really impactful there. Has gone a little bit slower because we've had to slow down the number of people that are actually in doing production and fulfillment and stuff and had to space it out throughout the day a little bit more. But yeah. um, we're actually, now we're, right before like even this week hit we were back up to middle of february middle of january numbers without sales going on and stuff like that so we're kind of right back back where we need to be and um, had a good sell this month right before ended on sunday and then stimulus hit wednesday and the yeah. last three days have actually been at the same numbers as sales and like we took that hit on amazon as well right like went from <clears throat> pretty significant to 40 50 percent hit switch stuff over to fpm and then saw that that actually negatively impacted things even though with fba they were saying they were getting it until like end of april or middle of april or whatever it was they were still yeah. more likely to buy fba and so we shifted everything back over that direction um, now we started to get fulfillment and stuff that we can start shipping back in a lot of our products. Um, so <clears throat> we're starting to get shipments going back out to Amazon and numbers are just looking really good now, honestly. So, yeah. So uh, a lot there too. I'm yeah, there is a too. lot. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's great. I mean, there's so many jumping off points. So I want to, I want to make sure we talk about um, pivoting, and just kind of from a business model, it, it's been phenomenal to see what businesses have been able to do in this time. Um, I want to talk about ad strategies that um, Brian touched on. And I would also love to kick this off with what you guys are seeing from the stimulus bump. And I, it's also so interesting just how this is all tying in together. So <clears throat> Tony or Caitlin, if you've seen anything from Wednesday on or, and yes or no, I just. Uh, truthfully, I haven't, I mean, the stimulus, I think is still a little bit too new. And some of the things yeah. that I've been reading, uh, at least uh, in Google news or what have you, or just around news in general, is that a lot of those stimuluses are going less toward spending more toward food in the grocery market. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I think unless you were pretty solid prior to that, stimulus that most of that is probably going to go toward the essentials again either if it's not going to your mortgage it's going to food and, and a lot of that so i would mm -hmm. assume that's where a lot of it will be headed um yeah i, I don't know caitlin uh, anything I, I haven't seen very much since wednesday 
Yep. Um, so Wednesday was one of the best days that we have seen um, in a while for some of the brands. Um, and then it did slightly drop off yesterday, but it, it was a lot better than it was before um, the stimulus checks came in. So um, yeah, I think so far everything is looking very good post Wednesday. Interesting. And what kind of, um, what kind of products or brands are you seeing? Mainly it's a fashion retail vertical um, that we are looking at. Um, so a lot of some home organization, some skincare, and then of course your typical like clothing and footwear. So every, every vertical saw a little boost on Wednesday and some are maintaining after even. Interesting. Interesting. And that's kind of what we're seeing is we, last week we ran a sell, like I said, and we were doing, I, I mean, we're, technically a mid-sized brand. So we were doing like 100,000 plus days, direct consumer, Amazon was doing well. And then we had a post drop off, but it wasn't like our normal sales drop even come Monday. It was like back to just like a normal day. And then Wednesday hit and then we were back up to actually sales numbers without any sales going on. And it's continuing. And one of the things that has stood out to me is I've been like reading and looking through like previous recessions and even the depression and kind of what people were doing right around that time is one thing that still sold during the depression was red lipstick. People still want to buy things that make them feel good about themselves. And our products are designed for active lifestyle, things like that, but they're also designed. So that's why I think some of the fashion apparel, some of those things that might not be quote unquote necessities, but might be from a mental health standpoint, so to speak, to make you feel good about yourself. I think that's where some of that's rebounding there. That's really interesting. And on the sales, um, Brian, had you been planning that already or is that new? Yeah, no. So like we have sales, like we have our sales calendar planned out pretty much for like three, a quarter generally. Um, every now and then we'll throw okay. something in randomly. Like we did a leap day sale, which like matched our Cyber Monday sales nut data pre all of this, right? So like we literally had a, a random day in the middle of February because it only happens once every four years that we did Cyber Monday numbers. Um, but what's interesting is the sell was a spring surprise sell that I'd actually planned on doing the week after everything hit, like March 17th, March 18th. And I didn't think throwing surprise into something. I already had all the creative, everything else. We're giving away like two mystery rings as part of like buying something on the side, which is a sell we had never done before either. And so we weren't sure how it would hit. And we went back to like kind of one of our standard, like always works types of things. And it did okay. But we're like, well, we've got this creative. We're planning on doing a sell anyway. So let's just roll this out. And it performed phenomenally. So um, it was kind of, it was interesting to see that even a new thing that we'd never really tested actually performed really, really well. That's interesting. And um, Caitlin there, um, Tony, have you been, clients doing different promotions or how are they ramping things up or trying to shift things I around? I'll jump in on this one. Um, I we're seeing the exact same thing that a lot of brands are doing things that they have never done before. And it, that's actually what is working. Um, so deeper discounts or maybe discounting products that never go on sale and it's bringing them back up to that level, at least on the um, search side of things, data is starting to look um, normal whenever things are on sale. But that is a trend that I'm starting to see that Brands are just discounting things and doing things a lot differently. And um, that's what's working. And it's not things that, that has, has historically worked. So just more volume, thing. lower margin. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo that. I mean, I think our clients are a little bit different. Um, they're just, they're, they're quite a bit larger, right? So they're multinationals for the most part and, and not in, a couple are in essential categories. Some are not. Um, I think, you know, we, we've really kind of had to reframe a lot of things for them um, in, in, a, in a sense. So I think what we've really focused on, I think what we've heard a couple of times now is messaging, uh, just what, what to do with that messaging, right? Uh, it's got to be different than what it is today. Uh, we, we need to have empathy and be a part of that social fabric and we need to do um, some different positioning. So I think we've worked really, really hard over the last couple of weeks uh, to position our clients for new messaging that we want to update and push out through the ecosystem. Um, so we're looking to do that. 
Uh, we're also convincing them not to go dark. Um, and I know that's something that uh, I, I know early on, I think um, Greg was asking like, what do you, you know, what are we doing? Oh no, it was even you. That's right, Jean. That was your article uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, right when all this hit. Oh, yeah. Um, and we were advising to just sort of like maybe ease off the the gas a little bit, just just take it slow and let's see how it goes. Uh, and then we were doing a lot of our own research, and uh, what we found is that brands that go dark during recession, depression, or even crisis type periods have a very difficult time climbing back up the mountain uh, once things begin to normalize. Um, so we've been cautiously trying to figure out how to maintain a relatively solid spend. I wouldn't say like we're going overboard or access, but just enough so that we keep visibility in front along in combination with that new messaging, right? So it's, it's new messaging plus not going dark. Um, I think something else we've been focusing on is fundamentals. Uh, mm. and that's just something we've seen, <clears throat> at least with some of our larger brands, I would say that. I think maybe some of the more smaller mid-sized businesses have their fundamentals uh, pretty, pretty well stacked and they're going strong. Uh, with some of the larger ones, like this has always been a thought for them. It's something they've cared about. Uh, but you know, between you know, the 10 different things they have to accomplish every single year, every single day, uh, it's not to say that e-commerce has taken a backseat, but it certainly is now starting, I, I think everyone's seen it, it's just picked up into the limelight, right? So now all the warts are visible. Some of the things that we couldn't hide before are suddenly <laughs> like, whoa, that's pretty glaring and we should fix that. So I think that's something yeah. that we've really worked uh, over the last few weeks and are continuing to do is just set that table and foundation so that when we start building, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, and it's future proofing, right? Like if you have your foundation set correctly, um, I mean, there's a lot less work at, at the back end. Um, so putting in some of that grinding now is, is going to be worth it for us. Yeah. And on the, um, so the, the foundation that you're setting, is that more on the direct sales channels? work and, or? and just even on uh, our retailers right so there okay. there were things where like some of the information that we uh, we've seen around our products is mm -hmm. maybe a year or two old right like yeah. so there's been iterations on that and just trying to get through all of those retailers using uh you know our syndication tools and our platform tools uh now has really ramped up that effort so just making sure we have really nice standardized robust messaging across all of them uh, and and again, right, like, so as we develop this new messaging, like how fast is that turn coming to? Um, so we want to make sure that we're not uh, leaving some of that old messaging behind as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's where we're talking foundationally and ads, right? Like if it's not something that they've been traditionally uh, adept at doing or even put their toes in or, or have really thought about and now starting to, hey, let's, let's do a little bit, you know, just maybe even let's test the retailer, see how that works with this messaging type thing. Yeah. And how about you, Caitlin? So over on our end with messaging specifically, um, we've actually been taking in-store information. So maybe someone who's only shopped in-store and we're telling them something, something differently. So um, with ad customizers, luckily we were able to say, hey, the person usually shops at our outlet location. Um, and so we've been testing saying, hey, we miss you in-store come in, uh, shop our sale online because you can buy one and get one 50% off. So um, testing things that way to try and um, resonate with the consumer, but still give them a personal message um, to try and make them feel good during this time. Uh, so still kind of new testing those types of things out, but definitely being very cautious with messaging during this time overall. And how about on, from a budget standpoint, how are, um, how are you thinking? How are clients responding to recommendations? So uh, responding pretty similarly across the board and depending on what vertical, again, that has a different response as well. We mm -hmm. are saying do not go dark. Um, a lot of things um, that you, you were just saying previously, that's a lot of things that we're also trying to communicate. Um, so we're, we do not think that it's best to go dark. Um, and if anything, if there is an opportunity, if you are doing well right now to pull budget forward to support strong conversion volume, um, we're also recommending that approach as well. Um, for brands that may not be doing as well right now, like we said, we're not going dark and we're not, you know, um, 
being so inefficient, we're maybe pulling back our targets, especially on Amazon, since uh, that has been a little bit, it's been hit differently compared to a Google campaign. Um, so we're maybe aiming for a lower ACoS, so being a little bit more efficient, but not turning off non-brands, so still trying to reach new customers um, and spend budget there as well. So um, I think clients have been responding pretty well across the board. So paid search at least, or anything on Google or Amazon, um, those channels have been active throughout this whole time. Interesting. And um, in terms of messaging, I guess, um, how much are you thinking about it from a channel by channel perspective versus mm -hmm. synchronized messaging? And are, is, are there areas where you're finding um, certain messaging works better in you know, this case versus this case or in, in the kinds of messaging that you're seeing that is resonating? I haven't seen anything that is specifically resonating yet. Um, mainly, we're starting to test a new, some new things, so maybe some more information will be available in the future. Um, so the curbside pickup or like come pick up mm -hmm. or buy online and pick up in store, uh, one, if that's an availability for the brand, that's been something that's been helpful to continue messaging in the site link, so people are responding well to that. But um, in terms of anything specific, um, things that have been worked in the past. So for example, if you are having a sale on your site, still going with those best practices by including that percent off in that main headline. Um, some of the same historical things that we know work are still working now. Um, but as of anything specific that we're saying, um, I don't think we have data on that just yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I can echo that as well. Uh, I mean, the messaging that we are is, to Caitlin's point, yeah, we've been really pushing BOPIS delivery curbside. Um, so I think that's something just a social distancing, you know, is still in place and we're still shutting down retail-ish. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something we've really emphasized. I think I could also agree with Caitlin is that how that messaging is performing right now. Um, yeah, I think it is vertical by vertical, category by category at this point. Uh, the, you know, the essentials, yeah, right on. Those, it, it didn't matter to begin with, but now that we're adding a little bit of like, hey, you don't need to go in store. We can deliver. You can just kind of like swing your car by, run out and run back in. You're good. Uh, that's been great. Uh, I think for some of the non-essentials, uh, that's, it's interesting. I, I haven't really, we We've been trying. We haven't really seen one way or the other if it's working or moving the needle. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So I think that that for us is where we're at too. With yeah. The so is it more from a messaging standpoint? Is it more a don't say the wrong thing? Yeah. That yeah. that's our biggest concern is not stepping on our own foot uh, yeah. while we say something like that. So I think and there's a term that we we've been throwing around, it's called, uh, and I'm sure everyone knows, but like emotional ROI, um, as opposed to getting to like a true, you know, monetary ROI. So we're, we're looking to try to at least generate some emotional ROI if we're not doing sales, um, just to be one of those brands that was standing up and doing the right thing at the right time. Um, so I think that's something we're also looking at too, is like, we may not be moving the needle in terms of sales, um, because you're a non-essential, it's really difficult, both retail, Amazon, and across the ecosystem. I mean, just as logistics kind of grind a bit. So let's put out messaging that makes you, you know, be a part of this community. You're being a part of the effort and you're not looking like a vulture, I guess. I guess that's what we're trying to avoid that vulture look. Yeah. I'd say that's a really fine balance, right? Because in some ways you want to message still, but so for example, we came out with those medical rings, right? We already had slotted in the calendar, like, but later we just sped them up because we already had been working on a hero refresh since it came out full time as a CMO. Because like, that's where we have like the thin blue line and the, all of the other first responder rings and the military and flags and stuff like that. We didn't have a medical collection. And so I was going to add that in there anyways. And so it was a matter of okay, we have these sitting here. It's top of mind for everybody. Being a good marketer and being a good brand, like for growth, it's in some ways the right time, but we can't just do it as a money grab, right? And we also are one of those brands that actually likes to do good in the world, 
right? Like everything that we do isn't, we try and walk that fine line. We like, if we ever have an innuendo in and out, it's really subtle, right? Like everything is very family friendly and top of the line, not a lot of cursing, whatever it may be, right? And so finding a, a nonprofit that we could donate proceeds to while we could still get people to the site. And one of the things that we've noticed as we've been marketing and it's definitely being a mid-tier brand or like a middle market brand and being able to adapt and change quickly, being self-funded and not having millions in the bank. We already like, we're very cost conscious about what we did versus the returns that we did, we're bringing in. So nothing really changed there. Budgets diminished because our return, our revenue was diminished. We yeah. started looking at other ways that we could get in front of people, right? So um, luckily beginning of the year, we started leveraging SMS a little bit more <clears throat> and doing some of those things. And so like in March, one of some of the best messaging stuff that we did was we started finding some of the good news articles that were out there about some of the recoveries or this or that or the other thing or research that was going into whatever. And we put a blog post together and we're like, hey, still follow all the guidelines. Make sure you're doing what you need to do. Listen to the people that are in charge. But hey, there is some good stuff that's starting to show up about how this may not be the end of the world for everybody, right? And so we literally just would send out an SMS or an email. And um, I think it was like the top 5% of all blog articles on Shopify last month was that blog. And so just putting that out there, doing those types of things, had no sales messaging whatsoever, but it had a really good positive emotional ROI, right? And we started doing some more contests. We did a ring design contest and we're going to be launching those rings that customers designed end of this month. And we like did a turkey gobble, like we're like doing all these things and there's cash prizes there because we knew that that was something that people were concerned about as well. And just trying to get people stuck in their house to get their kids involved in doing things and just really kind of looking at the situation overall. And because we're a small brand, we can be really nimble because that's what we already were, but we've even gone more back to our nimble roots, I think over the last three to four weeks than we were previously, right? We started having processes and things were taking two or three weeks to do to like even really start to do things. And now we're like turning around stuff within a week. And yeah. so in some ways we're as busy on the creative marketing side as we were during Q4. If that makes yeah. Sense. So on the, on the um, nimbleness and um, being able to change things up so quickly, I'm so curious about sort of the long-term effects of this and where you, do you see sort of like a, a lasting impact on how businesses, commerce businesses think about um, their strategies and plans and how those get executed? And it, are things gonna be more agile to use that term, I guess, without thinking about it from a specifically systematic standpoint? Or do you think once things return to some semblance of normalcy that we'll go back to the, this is our project plan, this is how we do things? Um, or will there be a sort of the, the seeds of like, you know, what Brian was talking about, sort of the startup mentality and that nimbleness and seeing like, we can do this, we can make massive change really quickly. Um. I'll just say something really quick. I think being a smaller brand and having that nimbleness, like even for us, we went more back to those roots, right? And I don't think that it'll stay as hectically, proactively changing and adapting as we are today, but it's going to be more a part of our core because it's worked, right? Like mm -hmm. being able to do that flex and leveraging some of our strengths and uh, that we've got to be able to take an idea that's out there and something that is pop culture today that wasn't even a week ago and be able to design a product around that and get it to market within two to three weeks, including creative, including actual physical production, all of those things. I think that's one of those things we'll probably start slotting time in for, if that yeah. makes sense, once things yeah. get back to more to normal. Um, I think a lot of the bigger businesses are probably going to have the hardest time doing that, to be honest. I, and let's be blunt, humans are nothing if not very easy at forgetting things. So when things start to go back to normal, it's like, oh yeah, I remember that, that sucked. But it doesn't matter now, like everything's good today. So- Or that was so exhausting, think, it's, it was a fever yeah. dream, I don't even remember it anymore, you know. Exactly, so I, I, I think yeah. the ones that survive are going to keep it a little bit more there. And they're going to thrive even yeah. quicker and, and do that thing. Yeah. I think the ones that like adapt right now, but then they just go back to normal 
are going to be the long-term brands that die off anyways. Like, cause that was their with all of these direct consumer brands coming up, all of these not normal retailers, right? And not just I think we lost, oh, we're, we're losing you a little yeah, bit. That's like a JC Penny. Oh, there you are. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. That's right. Um, like the JC strategies and just went back to major discounting and store. I think they're going to probably die off because I don't have. We're losing you, Brian, again. All right. Well, we wait for him to get back on. I guess. Um, you know, where, what do you think? So Tony, you're working with yep. big brands. I am. And I, I would say this, this has certainly, um, I think opened their eyes a little bit. Uh, I, I would have to echo uh, Brian down there and, and just say that, yes, I would agree that if you return back to your normal way of things after this, I don't think it's necessarily a terrible thing, but it's certainly, I would say this, this in terms of how you are executing e-commerce, how you're executing digitally, if that doesn't change a little bit for you, it should, right? Like this, this has really, this, this should have emphasized like where the world was already moving. I think this is simply, this is simply put it into hyper acceleration. Uh, so I, I, I would imagine that, you know, generationally it'll start shifting backwards a little bit. I, I don't think all, pardon me, all the boomers uh, will go back to wanting to be super retail heavy, right? I, I think they've having to adopt and adapt to what's happening now. Many will probably stay with, you know, ordering online and, and the X and millennials and Gen Zs are now plowing into it. So I think, I think this is certainly going to change everything. And, and I would, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think for some of those deeper projects, as we were talking about like product innovation and creating new things like that, that does have to kind of slow down, right? Like that, that's gonna have to have a sort of incubation period to make sure it's right and that you're just not flipping things out. Um, but in terms of being able to architect promotional programs or architect uh, different types of plays in your ecosystem messaging or, or what have you, different types of advertising elements or even um, just getting product messaging out there or what have you, um, that has to speed up and that has to start a, I think, for some of our larger companies seeing that, yeah, we may not have had either a dedicated e-commerce or digital slash like division. Um, and now we need to start really focusing on that, right? Like now we have to build a team to start thinking about that specifically as opposed to either a combination of like having our salesperson play multiple roles or having, having just, you know, someone wear a lot of hats around this, like now carving out space for digital e-commerce. Yeah, agree. What, and what do you think, Caitlin? I would have to agree with everything that has been said. Overall, things are going to be different when we come out of this um, from a lot of ways. Um, one piece that I think might be different is maybe just being, so I feel like it's hard not to react right now and it's hard to be prepared for something that you've never gone through. And maybe some people have not gone through something like this before, or brands have not gone through something like this before. So okay. now it'll be always in the back of your head to whenever you're doing forecasting or you're planning to take a step back and you know remember times like this and to make sure that maybe we start having those plans in the back of our pocket, not just if things are going well, but if things like having multiple scenarios to be ready for. Yeah, the scenario planning is that's a really good point because um, it's easy to, I mean, we were all on this trajectory of things are going great, things are going great. I mean, I don't think anyone has lived through a full stop like we've gone through. I mean, 2008 wasn't, it was, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But, um, you know, it, this is just, I've never seen anything like it. Um, so I, yeah, I think the scenario planning is really interesting. That again, going back to the concept of humans are really good at forgetting. Um, you know, I think we're very good at forgetting the severity of things and how hard um, bad times are when good times are rolling. Um, but 
you know, I think, you know, from a process standpoint, I think there is going to be something that gets ingrained here um, that, uh, that the brands who are managing this the best during this time are going to have a cadence. Yes, they may have to take a breather um, and catch their breath, but, you know, I, I really do think just like the kind of D to C's had already started this propulsion, like you were saying, Tony, there's sort of this hyper acceleration um, from a you know, the digital transformation standpoint, uh, and particularly, I think, when it comes to to commerce and e-commerce, that it's going to get um, all of these things are just getting much more um, spotlighted of where things were already going. So, you know, curbside pickup, Bopis, the, you know, online to offline is, I, I think, going to have a lasting impact for those retailers that hadn't already started doing buy online, pick up in store. Like, wow. I mean, they've either had to pivot like yesterday so fast, or they're still behind. And that's going to be... That's a long-term problem. Yeah, I mean, we, we've so seen much some retailers turning it around almost immediately, just to your yeah. point, right? Like the moment, I think like two weeks into this, we saw a couple of retailers who uh, may have had buy online, pick up in store, immediately start adding curbside. Like, and I was impressed at the speed. I mean, it's either something they had cooking in the books and were like, oh, this is perfect. Do it, hit the button, make it go. Um, or if it started from scratch and they did it in two weeks, like, well, that proves to everybody we can do almost anything in three weeks. So, yeah. you know, the sky's the limit. And let, how do we work together to make that happen forever going forward? Like, how can yeah. we be there? So, yeah. And I also wonder if part of this is going to have, it's affecting the way that departments work together, right? So like for buy online, pick up in store is a perfect example. I've seen it, you know, the digital teams pushing it, the retail team doesn't want to do it. Uh, because of logistics and or who's going to get the credit for the sale. You know, it comes down to those kinds of arguments that this hasn't been executed because of this interdepartmental squabble over credit. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've seen any of those kinds of discussions sort of break free and um, from an internal and with, you know, within your agencies of orchestration coming together differently. Yeah, I mean that's really interesting. I, I think I think so. Um, I, I mean I I think the way I think the way we're working together is coming together. I think we're and everyone's moving at 100 miles an hour. So we've had to redo just an enormous amount of process. Um, how do we streamline it? What what's the most meaningful couple activities we need to do together before we all start marching off to complete? this particular project, right? Like, so I think that's really interesting. And internally, um, it's harder for me to speak to that, but I, I can tell you from the agency side, like we are, we're absolutely flying around. And, you know, we, like I said, uh, as I think Brian has said, and I think everyone's echoed, but we've, we have just meetings on top of meetings. And that's kind of why now, um, why the calendar is so full is just because we have to have these 15, 20 minute check-ins on the work because what I think, you know, outside of where we are, we're at today, I mean, if we'd made a mistake or we'd gone too far in one direction, simply, it's a lot easier to like get back in an office, pull back and then go back forward again. I mean, now, because no one can get together, we have to really make sure we're getting together to keep up the speed. Um, and, and so we'll see, I think, and maybe this changes the way we do everything going forward. Maybe we can always move this fast. Um, I don't know what, I mean, I don't know what type of mental toll it's taking on right. all of us though. So that's, yeah. that's where I'm trying to balance that is like, can we always keep moving this fast? Right. I don't know. Right. Um, so channel strategies, I just want to make sure that we're, um, I'd just love to hear what you're thinking in terms of, um, are there, have you been changing your strategies? You've been changing your sort of allocation where you see um, strength, now and where you're sort of projecting um, shifts to come or, or go, I guess. 
Um, I'll jump in really quick from what we're doing. So we've always been a very video heavy, YouTube heavy type of, of company to begin with, but we actually started shifting even more budget over towards YouTube because when you look at your Facebook newsfeed, except for like the last week or two, it started to get a little bit more positive, but it was pretty much 100% COVID-19, 24-7, whether it was news, whether it was people talking about it, even if it was like the stay-at-home meals that they were cooking now that they never could for, it was all related to what's happening right now in the moment. And everybody wasn't going to YouTube to find the news. They were going there to escape reality. And so we have like piggybacked on that even more. CPMs are down, the inventory's up, right? So like we're able to reach significantly more people for the same cost. And because our content was already that entertaining, didn't feel like an ad type of content, they're actually getting a break from their everyday life by even consuming our ads in that moment. And so we're getting that emotional ROI like you were talking about there a little bit more. So we're even starting to dig in more into, I've got a TikTok uh, things starting up here in the next week, right? Like if some of these platforms that are not so news focused, not so whatever, but they're like breaking away from life focus and getting that mental break, I think that everybody needs right now. That's where I'm starting to invest a lot more for our brand into, because even if it doesn't pay off today, if I can make it work within my row ass numbers I need right now to sustain the business and continue to keep all of us employed, it's going to pay off long-term because we're going to be, taking up that mental space so that when things return to normal, we'll be better set. Yeah. I can yeah. jump in real quick. Um, yeah. So some ways that we have been shifting our investment is we're finding some efficiencies and more general keywords. So non-brand search and PLAs um, with a lot of competition dropping out of the auction that were big players recently, we've actually, to what you were just saying, we're able to see similar costs with a lot more demand on, again, certain verticals. But um, like overall though, with less people in the auction, um, a lot of the investment is being shifted towards those um, more generic type of keywords. And we're actually seeing that uh, users are more likely to convert off of those keywords right now than they were prior to. Um, so that's been just one way that we're seeing investment move across channels right now is more into those prospecting type avenues where, again, not so much on maybe a prospecting Facebook, but maybe um, prospecting Twitter, which is a little weird, but also um, on the Amazon side, again, non-brand keywords, making sure that we are um, activating additional sponsored brand campaigns specifically. So I think uh, non-brand has been working very well and a great way to shift investment. Great. Yeah, uh, from our side, I think what we've really seen, I mean, just echoing a lot of what Caitlin said, a lot of what Brian said, I mean, we're trying to get all of that at once. So it's, it's certainly been really interesting to try to do all that. I mean, I think for us particularly, since a lot of our clients are, are very retailer focused, we're having up inside their own ecosystems now. Um, so we're trying to uh, really leverage and, 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 and sort of just stampede each of these systems and just become more visible inside each retailer ecosystem. Um, so, it's, you know, I, everyone's doing general searches, but people have retailers. And so for our clients, it's important to just be there as much as we can. We're also really heavying up on CRM. Um, and I think that's something we're really, uh, you know, it's not, it's not that we're not prospecting, but let's not, let's, let's make the people who already know us feel like we love them and care about them. And let's get, let's get them back in the mix. Um, so we're doing a lot of email marketing and a lot of uh, retargeting. So people who are visiting the site or even know about us, potentially dropping special offers on them and just figuring out how to keep them looped back in and loyal to the brand. Uh, and then Amazon is another really interesting one. Uh, can't say that I'm recommending more spend right now, uh, but if you are spending there, keep the spending, maybe even, you know, I don't know, maybe dial it back just a tinge. It's just really the logistic systems is what's given me that caution uh, that they they, they've kind of uh, sort of reverted back, even Prime has reverted back to a week now. And if uh, in some cases, I'm even seeing like even products I've ordered two weeks out at this point. So, I mean, it's just, it's just hard to want to keep feeding that beast, which is a really great beast to feed 
uh, but they aren't coming through the way they normally do. And, you know, yeah. I, I mean, without getting like weird and political, I mean, it's like, I don't, uh, you know, with the warehouse situation and everything that's yeah. they're going through, it's just like, I don't know what the right answer is, but don't go dark, but I certainly wouldn't be spending more there. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at. And that's where the nimbleness comes into play, right? And let's be blunt, like Amazon was this behemoth that nobody thought they could touch. And now they're having all of these issues. So I think that there's opportunity there for those that can actually figure it out and get it done to kind of almost fight back in some ways and try and build that brand opportunity to go more direct where maybe you relied on so much of your business coming through Amazon. And now all of a sudden, it's not just retail that you're struggling with and getting revenue now. It's the one that you counted on to save the sales that was retail was losing in the first place. Now they're struggling. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there for sure to like try and figure out what you can do to combat not just the current crisis, but also this behemoth that you're almost beholden to. That if you didn't work with, if you didn't give every extra dollar or two to try and make sure you were the one that people selected when they were there. Like, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of the, the sort of now fragmentation of the last mile services and everything else. So you know, watching uh, and read a few, quite a few articles about uh, lots of, you know, midsize and even larger companies now just outsourcing to multiple different last miles, right? So, yeah, uh, and having those connections, if you made them a year or two ago, and being able to sort of now push them back into the front and into the mix. So I think it's, it's fascinating to see like, the logistics system of the country just kind of unravel and then re-ravel and, and see all these players <laughs> uh start to emerge which is it's just it's it's awesome for me i mean i that's the kind of thing i'm like wow it's pretty yeah cool. yeah it's been really fascinating and i and i do think it's interesting because um you know a lot, a lot of people are saying well this is just consolidating amazon's power um which in a lot of ways yes but to your point um brian and tony there there are it's also showing chinks in the wall that had not been, you know, I don't think anyone thought were there. Um, and so the channel diversity, investing in your own direct um, becomes that much more of a, uh, I guess, realistic imperative. Yeah, and that's where I think some of those ones like Target and Walmart that have the retail locations that can actually get the product out quick enough yeah. Right. Like target own shipped. Right. So like being able to just leverage that now more than ever, like that's an opportunity that no matter how many dollars they plowed into it, like the incremental gains in market share was so small, it didn't really balance out on the books. But now there's that potential where it could, whether they actually really doubled down on that or they're still trying to conserve the cash because the thing like that's the challenge I think so many companies are doing even the big behemoths, right? Because there's still only so much cash in the bank at the end of the day. And a lot of these companies were running really lean to begin with because they just expected the next dollar to fund the next dollar that went out, right? And so they didn't have huge cash reserves sitting there necessarily. And so I think that's like, there's so many opportunities that were here that if there was the money there, they could leverage. And I just don't know if some of these big brands are able to right now because of everything going on. Yeah. All right. Well, we are coming up on time. This was really great. I feel like we could keep talking for like the next four hours. Um, it's great to see you all. I, Tony and Caitlin got to see you at SMX West. It was so great. And uh, Brian, I saw you at East. So hopefully we'll see each other again in person soon. But thanks so much for joining wow, us here you. on Live with Search Engine Land. And um, best of luck to all of you. Oh, it was so nice Thanks. seeing all of you. Thank you so much. You guys Absolutely. look beautiful and wonderful and stay healthy and safe, gang. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.